Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So I'm a Necron Cryptic, so what? Part number 9. Phileas didn't try to murder me. She understood in this form her forces would likely perish before they could manage to land a significant blow. We spoke for quite some time. I had already awoken 47% of the fortress's systems. It would take just under 50 years for us to begin moving. Orican and Trazin however were utterly fascinated by my form. I didn't have the time to answer their questions. Instead I was running thousands of subroutines and simultaneous transmutation across the fortress to repair the destruction caused by the invaders. This third resonance cascade has once more produced individuals possessing the unique madness classified now under the outsider virus. Phileas is unaware of their existence and as such I will quietly dispose of the 142 warriors, immortals, and death marks that present this deviation from standard Necron behavior. Awakening the spindle drones and guardians is within my power now. The infected were quarantined off and terminated with extreme abhorrence. The fortress consciousness was pleased by this development. This star fort was more subservient. The tutelage period was skipped when I had overridden its control under the seat and state. Instead I gave the order to fix that which was in my immediate power. The activation of the drones. Adjusting gravity inserting wings. Opening 27% of existing pathways, and operating the maglev system. This degree of manipulation is thanks to converting the blackstone into a negative charge, making it infinitesimally simple for those of Necron derivation to modify and work with. I would need to take control of the command deck if I wished to reanimate the remainder of the fortress's bulwark. Such as actually moving the star fort, its weapons arrays, grand scanners, shields and thousands of other integral systems. Unfortunately should I disconnect from the command throne I will return to the diminutive form. I had the doors to the command bridge opened, directing the void crew to follow my recommending my commands. I had roughly 23 years before my drain on the power network was more detrimental than it would benefit me. While I sealed myself in a chamber of my own design to conduct my own private work, I called for Trazin to release several of the Crystalline Elder into my care. And for Nehebko to bring me several of the Eldery pilots that were in Temporal Stasis chambers. Finally I had many resources from the ship brought to me. They complied, in fear of what destruction I could bring to them with this level of power. I had much I wanted to do with them, away from watching eyes. In the first 5 years I was able to complete a series of plates of sempaternal weave, enough to fully encapsulate my form when I remove myself from the tether of the command throne. By year 11 I had transmuted various refined metal alloys for future usage into existence. By the 19th I had discovered a means by which to replace my empiric gourd, using the crushed essence of part of the crystalline eeldery warlocks. I wove the new string from the Eldery essence into a gossamer thin thread and added it to my harp. By the 21st year my studies were interrupted, I had been informed a third Blackstone fortress had been located. Once the fortress was up and running we would be departing. I hastened my studies. My time was coming to an end. I hastily scribbled down plans that merited further study. Designs for solar based weapons, means of solar harvesting, protopylons. But my mind was growing and focused. I was hungry. No I was starving, painfully so. I looked upon the Eldery crystal statues, and the three Eldery pilots. My stomach knotted. And approached them. I tore one of the Eldery from the stasis field, dull consciousness lighting up on the face of the Eldery. They faced me with muted horror, the scarabs preventing the pilot from going into shock. I opened my instinctively, inhaling sharply. I felt air leave the Eldery as I began untethering the Eldery's soul from its body. A savory sweetness filling my near empty gullet. Such sweetness, more, I need more. I dropped the withered husk of the Eldery and moved on to the other two pilots. Such wonderful treats, how had I not considered such a rich fruit, I had allowed myself to be devoid of wonderful ambrosia. 
I found my supply of Yildiri had quickly run out and cursed. But something tugged at my attention. A Tart Minty Armora. A vintage spirit that I wished to savor. My eyes darted to the intoxicating supple forms of the crystal Yildiri Farseer and Warlocks. I ran my tongue against the face of the Yildiri's crystalline helm. I had a fiendish grin. Pure soulstone stuff. A treat. After this revelation I gorged myself on each of the Yildiri. It was as if I had stepped back into a grand celebration. Every confection, liquor, and savory meat one could enjoy. Their ancient disciplines of potent sicker sorcery had been fermented and aged to a ripe perfection for me to sample. My consciousness was slipping, bit by my shards. Did I love the tastes of souls? Be Oricon. I have been assisting executioner Phileas and her fellow Praetorians weave through the snaking paths of the fortress for several days now. Rewriting the flow of time, guiding their combat algorithms, and occasionally divining the future in rare instances. We have already cut down approximately 362 Eldery in their heavy constructs. But then came the Belefire, waves of it. It transmuted the Blackstone to a cold emerald blue sheen. I saw it overtake and burn the warriors of the Praetorian. It overtook myself and Phileas. I became unbound from time, my body vibrating out of step with the flow of reality. I was running dozens of impossibly complex scans to understand this phenomena. Every subroutine was simultaneously midway through complex chrononal divinations. Casting a divinatory zodiac I divined the source of this influx of processing powers. Miraculously it took but a few seconds to complete the zodiac rather than the many hours. That Technomancer Ishska is responsible for all this, this was an extension of his power. I quickly directed the party to follow me, I had divined a path to the heart of the fortress. We marched onwards for a week. That week was filled with many curiosities. The Eldery had become diminutive frail things, many died before we could raise our arms to them. That did not stop the empowered executioner from normalizing them completely. What's more we noted much of the fortress had been transmuted, indeed miles of the fortress bore transmutation icons. The Technomancer was working on the fortress at levels previously unseen. Such power, I needed to discover the means by which he had gained these abilities. Was this the peak of Technomancy? No matter, after a week of walking we had arrived to the Grand Throne Room of Ishska. And his being was resplendent. He had achieved a form reminiscent of the Setan Star Gods. Phileas sent myself several messages to ensure that we have a return set. She parlayed with the energy form Ishska. I began analyzing his composition. Phase Necrodermis, Plasma, Phosphorus, and hundreds of other molecular compositions many of which I couldn't even register. At one point I noted a fragment of empiric energy readings, but I soon dismissed it as an error. Immense energy readings matching that of multiple Setan shards. It's astounding. This Technomancer really is something else. I begrudgingly voiced. Another voice besides me spoke. He has arrived at something truly superb hasn't he? Turning beside me I saw one of the Necron warriors shift. It was Trazin, reshaping the warrior into his own hateable form. He has done what you have sought to do has he not? Trazin continued. Obtain a form of energy. He clarified. I scoffed, but I had to concede the point. I admit he has achieved a most resplendent form yes. He has conducted rituals and greater rites of transmutation simultaneously at such a great scale, and unprecedented. But this is but a facsimile of what I wish to attain. Trazin cut me off. Yes yes, a form of starlight of course I am aware. Forget me bringing it up. Trazin was a fool, but shards damned him, he was right. This form was perhaps equivalent to perhaps. Three maybe even four shards? When he and the executioner concluded their discussions I had an entire month's worth of data on his Setan form. I tried to discuss with him but instead he sent me off to meditate further on my temporary boost in abilities. He refused to answer my questions and could instantly detect when I was about to change the timeline and halted me. Trizin was informed of nothing and instead was ordered to prepare materials for him. He planned on conducting his own studies in this form. What advancements could he make during this time as a star god? Already he was conducting his works all over the vessel, making its activation process exponentially faster. 
Already it was nearly 50% of the way towards full operations. I watched the seat and seclude himself. For two decades I focused on my own studies. I had made many discoveries. My own energy collection ports fully opened. The constant stream of energy made for greater feats of temporal and divinatory work. In a wonderful blend I fused my areas of expertise making dozens of divinations across multiple timelines. Forcefully and seamlessly merging the timelines to solidify my possible works into a concrete timeline. In a short period I had divined the location of yet another fortress, once more it was inert. My future continued to the decades ahead. It was easily conquered. And in the decades ahead, this third black stone would be used in unison. I could see why the cryptic wanted this fortress. I watched him command this third and the first fortress in unison to destroy a planet. So this was what he was after. And he wishes to claim even more. Need to wake up. Feel extremely cold actually, and everything feels stiff. When I finally take a peek around I find that I'm not alone. Two silver colored skeletal figures stand to either side of me, their backs to me, they haven't noticed me yet. It takes me a second to identify what the hell they are. A gaggart and voidments are for Nornit. Oh shit it's this routine again. My head feels like it's been all over the place. I placed a hand to my head. Fuck me. How long? For Nornit piped up first. Four years. Thanks fan. I painfully pulled myself from the casket, quickly looking around. When did you build a sarcophagus in the command room? I was pleasantly surprised to find out that we were on the command bridge of the Blackstone Fortress. She answered once more. Four years ago. Um, alright. I clapped my hands together, stretching my body hoping to hear bones pop. How far along are we in the second fortress activation? 23 years. It seems there was siphoning power which was promptly removed around the time you were brought back. A Agakut answered flatly. So he means me. Have communication lines been set up across the fortress yet? For Nornet nodded. Yes lord. Put Phileas on the line, I'd like to speak with her. I ordered. Soon enough a clear holographic projection of her person popped onto the command deck. Immediately I was met with a hostile visage. You've finally awoken, I see you didn't perish. You continue to thin my patience with these acts of yours cryptic. I interjected. But all the same I am providing results aren't I? Her murderous gaze only increased. Her face hasn't changed a single bit but somehow I know she was holding back how utterly livid she was with me. She eventually simmered down. It may be true that this. Resonance cascade event has been incredibly beneficial. I only now noticed she was still very much consumed in Bielfar. We are ahead of schedule with your own previous estimations. With the fortress placed within negative polarity and your transmutations. Implementing and integrating Necron technologies has been seamless. In fact it seems your alterations have been tailor made for us. She paused to look down at me. You'll of course need to hand off navigational power to myself and my void crew. I sighed. Of course, allow me to head over. She ended the line. I rushed off to Phileas via the webway gate. When I arrived at the second fortress I made my way straight for the command bridge. Already I saw Oricon and several Technomancers working away at the complex machinery. All of them were burning with Bill fire. Hello XQT I was hoisted by my neck by Phileas. I was lifted several feet into the air, even when I straightened my shirty posture I still couldn't reach the ground. She crushed my neck servos now this will be the last time you go above my head. Do you understand me cryptic? I nodded feverishly. She released me and I dropped like a lead anchor. My neck reformed back into shape, the damage done undone in a few short seconds. Ugh, may I take to the console your executioner? At this point I was glad I couldn't emote. Because at this point I would have looked pretty ticked off. For the next two decades I worked wordlessly on the fortress, getting every mechanism of the fortress online. I spent much of the time having a subroutine speaking with Oricon via interstitial messaging. He mostly wanted to talk about the form. I clarified a few things, but basically strung him along with some hints if he would engage in conversation with me. The fortress had a more reserved personality, eager to please and willing to follow unorthodox orders. 
It recognized me entirely as its captain. Its consciousness briefly spoke with its sister fortress. The pair of fortresses would work together but they were too different to work in perfect unison. I was informed by the first fortress there was a means to neutralize the charge but it would leave the fortress inoperable for an entire century. I didn't see that as a viable option. I eventually gave command to Phileas and we began to mobilize for the third fortress. Orican informed us we would not encounter any yieldery during the time we would be awakening the fortress. That was a massive plus. The next fortress from what Orican described was in the Cyclops cluster. I oversaw identifying major planets within the subsector to allow us ease of locating the fortress. Phileas was quite keen on observing this and was over my shoulder the entire presentation. Orican used my intel to his advantage and charted a three year trip to the next. I was eager to take the fortress, I kinda wanted to test out its planet's destroying capabilities. I think I'll hold off on telling Phileas about it until she stops breathing down my neck. I didn't understand until a recent conversation with Trazin just how lenient she's been with me. At this point the threats I've gotten have been more for show for the rest of the tree arc. I should have been dead at least 37 times over, most of that was just for minor transgressions against formality. Along the way several scout elements joined along with us. They were to join in the main fleet in the defense of our own pair of star forts. Beyond a passing herd of plasmic medusae floating in the void. There wasn't anything that really stopped us from reaching the fortress. We assembled the usual spelunking troop once more. After a week of exploration and relay setup we found that this fortress was also inert and only its systems were down but powered. We had time to take over it. Using the webway gate I had us teleported to its heart. For the next 173 we were undisturbed as we worked to raise the slumbering fortress. Before the 173 years was up the Belefire ran its course, needing well into the 36th year. Everything was up to snuff and now we were waiting on Oricon or one of the scouting fleets to find the other fortresses. In the meantime I asked Phileas if she would indulge me in a weapons firing test. It would require some coordination, so I handed off the third fortress's console controls to Trazin for the time. We flew out to what would be the future penal colony in the subsector. I started to explain the power of one Blackstone fortress to Phileas, and she seemed somewhat disinterested. Likely she believed she knew everything there was to it. So with her permission I began the weapons firing test. The great bulwark of machines shifted. Pistons and ancient machines of techno sorcery began humming. The monumental cylindrical cannons pulsing with vibrating psychic might. Both fortresses were illuminated in billions of blinding motes of violet lights. The light show of Empyrean energy swiveled and snaked along the length of the cannon, quickly lighting up runic designs that stretched on for miles. I looked to Trazin on the display glyph. Firing in 3. 2. 1. From my cannon the torrent of warp fire beamed out in a concentrated line, flecks of massive swaying embers flowed out in every direction from the beam. To the uniformed it would seem as if my beam had gone astray, this great discharge of potent psychic energies would only land a glancing shot on the planet's eastern continents. I continued to look on in awe. And then I saw the second beam of streak across the view, Trazin had fired his own warp cannons. His own beam fired off violently towards the western reaches of the planet. Phileas spoke. Your beams are heading to an intersecting trajectory cryptic. Do you plan on scorching the surface in a pincer of beams? I couldn't help but let out a right chuckle. Please keep watching Executioner. I didn't let my attention be pulled from the spectacle. As Phileas had expected the volatile beams intersected, but rather than continue in the direction they had fired in. The beams coalesced into a singular nova beam. From the intersecting point the two beams conjoined into a singular even more fierce beam. She watched in rapt curiosity as the joined beams now aimed for the center of the planet. The great flood of light surged to the world with killing intent. When the beam struck down, the planet was instantly bathed in a wash of the violet colored warp fire. We could see the mantle crack and a crescendo cluster of detonations pop up across the many land masses all across the surface of the world. Yellow line breaks appeared across the whole of the planet, molten infernos flooding as the continents were engulfed in magma fires, and ametrium flames. I could trace explosive detonations that pop through the sound barrier, hundreds of them. 
areas of continental green leveled and blackened in the shockwaves. The seas hissed, boiling, sea creatures cooked in the sudden rise and exploded into great steam gouts across the surface of the world. Phileas watched wordlessly. The world's death throes were something to behold. I spoke with Phileas in private for a number of days after the planet died. She had much to ask and I admitted the star-killing capabilities of a trio of fortresses. Her interest redoubled. For now we planned on watching development on the scouting fleet. Developments were slow, and it was only now that I began to appreciate how bloated the Imperium was. During the Gothic War the whole subsector was teeming with life. No wonder the Gothic Wars only lasted like 20 years. Some months after the destruction of the planet, we received hails from a few scouting ships locating another Blackstone fortress. When we arrived at the Bean Moor subsector, we were surprised that the Blackstone was covered in so much debris. It would take a decade alone to simply break through the layers upon layers of caked on sediment. We deployed a scouting team and a sea of scorpoids all across the fortress. If I'll be honest, it sort of reminded me of when Necron's fleet ships deploy billions of Necron scarabs to strip their enemy ships. But now it was being done on a fortress. Note to self, build bigger swarmed assemblers. I said to myself. We would work away on cleaning the outside, while teams joined me in taking over the fortress. The webway gate on the thing was down for some reason. This fortress was in shit condition. Holy shit it was powered but malfunctioning. We lost quite a few constructs to so many of the malfunctioning maglevs, crushing levels of gravity, oil chambers that simply flooded over. Conservative estimates to get to the command chamber and start the awakening process say. Two years? Fuck me this is just gonna a painful process. We have work to do. The next 40 years were a slog to work through. Phileas didn't let me go see Tan to wake the fortress. If only things went smoothly. After working non-stop for four decades Zorikan burst into the command room with great urgency. He spoke rapidly. The Eldery will be on us in just a week's time. Scanning over Orican I found his temperature was elevated from usual parameters. He just jumped back in time. He continued on. All at once we lost a hundred scouting vessels suddenly. Only a small collection of craft managed to escape to inform us with Eldery attack craft rushing after it. Phileas rose up quickly. Orican, did you receive the scale of the fleet before you returned? The cryptic nodded. Hundreds of Eldery and at least one craft world were detected by our sensor sweeps. I am fairly certain they are already in the sector, making holes in our network of scouts craft. They seek to start war, and claim the fortresses. We prepared, by god we prepared. Mass warnings were sent out to our scouting craft. We were starting to get a measure for what we were dealing with once several of our craft returned to us. An entire craft were all heavily augmented with a number of infinity cannons, holy shit that doesn't bode well. Five void stalkers were also found in orbit of the craft world. Each of those void stalkers had several dozens of other fleet elements in formation around them. The main force numbered around 200 battleships, battle cruisers, cruisers, and light cruisers. It was noted that some elements of light cruisers and escorts craft conducting their own searches for the fortress. Easily they had twice as many scouting forces moving about the gothic sector. They came here with clear intent to take the fortresses, or maybe to destroy the ones we have. The first war for the Blackstone fortresses had been started. This malfunctioning fortress wouldn't be up for at least another 30 years and that was with Orican and Nehebkoi using their chronomancy abilities. Unfortunately Orican was currently being used to predict the movements of the enemy fleet. We already have set up defenses in the subsector, along with relocating the malfunctioning fortress to the edge of the system. At best the fortress could fire from one of its cannons. Moving to the next solar system was out of the question. Fuck me, how was it that the Imperium and Chaos was able to make use of these so fast? Probably all the fucking warp fuckery letting them hotwire them. I hated the idea of an Eldery getting their hands on one of these. While Orican divined, I was tasked with reactivating the defensive system of the malfunctioning fortress. Easier said than done. This broken fortress. Its consciousness was not so easily understood. Jumbles of fragmented thoughts. More a mess than my own mind, it was like. 
Well digital dementia is the best way I could describe it. Integrating myself into the system was easy but getting lost in the tide of static and uncertainty. I did my best. Oricon had found out where the enemy fleet was headed. A five year voyage on the galactic west of our system. Tracing its path, and the help of our scout fleets, they were bound for another fortress. The Lizard subsector by the looks of it. Bastards had found it before us. We could reasonably get there months before their own cruisers secured the system, but not without leaving this crippled fortress behind. We were just under 20 ships not including all of our escort craft. In the end we would split our forces. Two fortresses and 12 of our Necron vessels to try and take the fortress. While Trazin and Agaklet stay behind with the remainder of the fleet and the negatively charged fortress. Rural is a great app available on the Apple and Google Play Store as well as desktop for creating beautiful 8-bit character art. The app has 14 supported races, 150 plus weapons, 400 plus armor pieces for you to mix and match, 20 plus mini bases. There is that much to work from I was able to make Cold Steel the Hedgehog, the God Emperor of Mankind, Pepe and they are always adding more artwork. The app also has a character sheet to help keep track of everything during games. And if that wasn't enough you can play about with the app for free with limited artwork. So go ahead check it out and if you decide to buy the app use promo code NICKBEDIA for 10% off and it lets them know we sent you. It's a great sponsor and a great app and we hope you guys go ahead and check it. But let's get back to the video. Nehabcorp bought a lot of time in the time bubble. Before we left the new fortress had its spindel drones operating. Not operating at peak performance but they were operating all the same. Phileas was preparing me to take control of the fortress by using the Setan form. Assuming dominion over the fortress was likely the only way we would get the upper hand on the Eeldery. Well that wasn't entirely true. While I had been running through every piece of Eeldery lore I stumbled on a few things of note that could be used. I checked over the records afforded to us by the magnitudes of scout craft that had returned. Fragment by fragment, planet by planet, we had recorded much of the gothic sector. 49% by my own estimations. There was one artifact I wished to take. Be of Rala Ulthrawil. My escape from the clutches of the Cyclopean enemy was a terrifying thing. The talisman guided me and my chosen wraith seer in my wounded state. The voice of our god calling to us, guiding us another way. Was it that ball that called to us? A webway gate for us to escape through. We were plunged into the deepest reaches of the webway. I was so weak, confused and lost. We were before an unfamiliar place on the webway. And I swear I heard the laughter from several disembodied voices. Show yourself. I cried out. I was still held within the grip of my wraith seer. I was dying. My lifeblood was fleeing me and I was in no means capable of calling upon runes of fate. The laughter only grew, raising to 20 voices. No, 50 more joined in their belly aching laughter, it irked me. You think this humorous? I shouted. Hundreds more voices added to the cacophony of laughter. One icy voice cut through the manifold of jeering hysterics. Oh but I do, little shadow seer. Emerging from the darkness was a waxy grinning just a thing of immense size. The laughing god. Yes that is correct little one ha 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 His great form slipped from the darkness. He moved erratically, like a puppet tangled in its own strings. Jester god, what do you want of us? I shouted out. Blood gouted from the hole from my abdomen, the wound stressed by my shouting. The cacophony of laughter ceased. Segarach's voice was dropped to a hushed whisper. I need you to obtain something for me. I balked, I must be truly dying, for the laughing god was before me and I was bleeding out. How else could I reason this? What deal do you have in mind? I asked while I still had consciousness. His icy voice continued. You have seen the immortal enemy, you have heard his wisdom. I wish for you to claim one lost child of our stars. One captured and who will be tormented. He wove a psychic illusion of things to come, the great design of the gods. A long colorful tapestry in a state of tatters. I gazed upon the great design trying to discern meaning. 
The first image showed the immortal enemies waking in mass led by a cyclopean necron. Ishka. I whispered weakly. The next showed an image of a horrid sapphire colored god thing. A setan feeding upon the souls of 100 horrified Eldari. It continued on to greater horrors. Images of the six burning fortresses above in the sky, below a conflict between the greatest warriors of the Eldari and the forces of the immortal enemy. A bloody battle would be fought that would cripple both my people and the enemy. Worlds would die, stars would burn, entire solar systems lost in our struggle. The tapestry seemed scratched, burning embers licking the edges of the great design. The tapestry broke into branching paths, the first we saw five of the great talismans opening a wretched iron reality with their great power, mutually assured destruction at the hands of empiric things. That path dragged on and seemed to be shredded. Dangers. The second showed two fortresses destroyed and the Eldery homeworlds burned and destroyed. That path burned away to matted charcoal black. The third was curious. It was the longest, and the true path the laughing god wanted me to see. A losing path. One that would claim the lives of many of my kindred but ensured a new way for my people. A crooked black hand was claimed for my people during the war with the immortal. A hand of darkness. A daring rescue for a soulless thing. And a horned mask. This path led to renewed tapestry, a chance for success, a future we could forge. The laughing god offered me a horned porcelain mask. So a pact was made to the laughing god. And so was I cast out into the webway. My vision faded and uncount scenes took me. When I awoke, I found myself in the care of medics of temples of Isha. I was safe, secure, saved by the laughing god's machinations. And so I let myself relax, heal, and breathed easy in the care of capable hands. For when I was healed, I would launch a war against the immortal enemy. For the hand of darkness. And the soulless Eldery. When I reconvened with the forces of the Great Council, I was met with open arms. The Council was preparing to apprehend the vile threat, but their plans were too small-minded for my liking. As the one most versed in this experience I was the loading force in the war efforts. And so for a century and then some I prepared my forces. 20 million joined our cause willingly, those of the craft world that was saved a few centuries prior. Their life debt would be paid forward in the effort. And a select 350,000 were called to arm. We had amassed a war fleet in a few short decades. I had selected my own team of seers for our true objective. Those of the greater fleet were set to claim these other fortresses in the system. While I would spearhead a force to claim the hand. And to claim one worthy of the mask Segarach had entrusted to me. Biyshka. We were well on our way to the next fortress. Every moment counted and I had to use my time wisely. I had been pleasantly surprised by Phileas informing me of work I had conducted as a Cetan. To be honest I actually can't recall what had occurred in those 20-ish years. When led to the sanctum I was greeted by many strange things. A red powdery residue all across the floor, several sets of Eldery Xeno mesh armor on the ground. Plates that were unmistakably sympaternal weave. Of the larger items I noted a singular Eldery pilot in a stasis chamber, they seemed. Gaunt. Tearing my attention from that I was pleasantly surprised by several bullions tons of metal I had supposedly made. Damned if I knew what any of them did. After a few precious hours I had applied the sympaternal weave to my person. I had secured my future with a nice plus one to my toughness and wounds. Or rather, if reality functioned like the tabletop I would be a fair bit more sturdy. With this influx of materials got to work. Day in and day out I worked alongside the fortress's vast consciousness to get things going. I worked frustratingly tedious work of repeatedly requesting the fortress produce guardians drones. It was a slow process but steadily I was producing around 20 or so of these drones in a week. I should likely move to something easier for me to do. I invited Chari to help with other productions, mostly to get a few more ideas. Chari seemed to be possessed with a number of designs that warranted some looking into when I wasn't so pressed for time. He had made some advancements with crafting materials and some automatons that seemed eerily like Star Wars droids. He was mass producing them on a scale I could appreciate. These new constructs would be nice as a buffer between our troop elements. 
We caught up for a brief time, exchanging some information. Seeing as he had a fair bit of competency, I entrusted Shari with the designs of a certain Star Wars concept from my own memories. Dark Troopers. He would likely be stuck on the design for some decades maybe even millennia but it would be nice to see some new advancements. Eventually we ran out of time for our great many projects. We had arrived at the Lizard subsector. Calling for preemptive scans before we deployed through the Eldery webway gate built into our own fortresses. We were a multitudinous number of life signs already present. Both Phileas and I leveled a gaze to Oricon. Oricon. I was to believe the cruiser elements weren't yet to arrive for another two and a half months. I said with a barely restrained murderous edge. He sputtered, about to make excuses. I silenced him with a gesture. It didn't matter, the timer had begun. The next months passed by extremely painfully. While we were transported into the fortress we were in its teleportarium and not its webway gates. Something or someone had interfered with our jump through the gate. Not only that but we lost an entire 19% of our force from the get go, worse yet was that those forces lost completely. We found an abundance of resistances all across the fortress. We would not take the fortress in any easy manner. The Eldery had set up a numerous warp peril for us to find in dozens upon dozens of ambushes. They had taken to advance their arsenal and I was filled with a level of dread when I began to see the signs of Corsair jet packs and the warp spider jump generator. They had found ways to weaponize teleportations against us. It seemed like they had been caused by the misfire in our jump into the webway gate. We had no choice but to fight the Dug and Eldery as they fizzled in and out of reality or swooped overhead. If I'll be honest their tactics were eerily similar to that of the Scourges. They hit us hard, constantly blocking off our ways with near constant assaults. They had lately taken picking up our most competent units and displacing them entire kilometers into the air letting them reach the ground with a painful spine shattering crash. Or in worst cases doing what amounted to bombing runs with melter bombs. They gave us a good fight as we slowly advanced towards the heart of the fortress. After nearly a month we had whittled down their force to around a quarter strength. We had lost a considerable 58% of our initial forces in the first month. We had originally brought a force of around 300, not including our Canoptech units. After rudely tearing the Eldery from their dugouts we were finally able to figure out why they had been able to disrupt our teleportations. They had filled the center chambers of the fortress with fucking crotalids and a number of unstable jump packs. Essentially making it impossible to translocate into the innermost chambers. They did it as a tactic to ensure we couldn't reach the center command spire after finding out they couldn't access it. I had the few captured Eldery vented, without any soul stones. I was something beyond furious. When we finally opened up the inner chamber a sea of crotalids and several liquid tons flooded outwards onto us. Fucking fantastic. We fought through the tide of teleporting meat for an hour. I saw one bite into the torso of a Praetorian and mash away between its razor sharp maw. Another I saw catch a lich good and begin a violent death roll, before vanishing into a puff of evaporating warp stuff. There was a death mark trying to escape and reposition itself only to be swarmed by a trio and ripped to shreds. On the countering end I witnessed a wall of scarabs disassemble an entire cluster of a dozen crotalids in a matter of seconds. After that full offensive of inmitic base weapons rapidly destroying the oncoming waves upon waves of the foul swamp beasts. They fought us to the bitter end, ensuring we bled for every meter we gained. When the hour was up, the entire room that had been filled with brackish green water was now colored a sanguine crimson. We took to the command spire, having to force our way in this time. Normally these doors parted easily but for some reason this wasn't the case. Our scorpioids cut into the chamber which allowed us to ascend. Far more titanic reaching symbols in the walls and floors. I could feel my body ache looking at them. Wards, I instinctively thought. If I was honest with myself I felt this very well may have been a badness will of eternity. Something power lingered within these great sigils. I felt myself shake, pinprick chills crawled over my form as we continued towards the command console. Every surface of this colossal chamber shines with an iridescent gleam of a dark and emerald. Every tiled space is marked by a series of vast serpentine and twisted runes. 
each faintly illuminated in a dull rose-tinted glow. We strived onwards up the mounting stairway, the shine of each great design seeming to rise in intensity with each step we took onwards. I felt the familiar heat at my side and noted this newer interaction of the Emperor and Cord seemed to react to this light. Mirroring the siphoning of warp energies much like the fortress own cannons. I shuddered at this. As had been to be expected the skulls and bones of ancient slan remain sentinel. Fragrances of a thousand dead worlds filled my nostrils. And I didn't seem to even question it. Still we passed forward. More and more my very essence stirred under the weight of ancient history. Every glance at the worn smooth bones of the long dead slan stirred something in me. I swear I could see them in flesh as plain as I saw the warriors around me. My mind was splitting and I needed to move to the console. This fortress was worming itself into my mind like no other. What divine intelligence possessed it, was seeking to possess me. I ran manically, each clinking tile of my cloak ringing out in painful shrills of metal against metal. Every clink hurt my non-existent ears. Hurriedly I grabbed my interface jack at the base of my tile and made way for the console. It was in my sights finally. 20 meters. Static took over my eye, removing the dozens of reports that danced across my vision. 10 meters. Saurian cries and chittering rattled in my skull. 5 meters. I could feel my own skin and bones again. 1 meter. I could feel air filling my lungs, the sensation of living filling every crevice of my being. I slammed my tail connection into the command table, forcibly taking root into the system. I gripped my harp, my hands shuddering. This isn't real. I told myself as I heard my voice from life ring out. My mind coursed through the myriad systems, trying to push back against the fortress. Slowly I reached for the two cords I was so often using as of late. While my mind rooted its way into the alien designs of the star fort I could see through the eyes of the fortress. I could see a score of Eldari vessels on their way. We're out of time. I voiced lowly. I finally strummed the two god transmuting chords. Once more through ancient sciences I reached that divine apotheosis. The gothic war had began. From my observations our fleet ships were hopelessly outnumbered. We were looking at a formation of nearly 20 ships that we could identify. We weren't picking up any cloaked vilses. They traveled within a spearhead formation led by several frigates and destroyers. For the moment we were well out of optimal firing range. Still that did not deter the Carrion class from spooling its lightning ox. Already our enemies began firing upon us. Sending walls of missiles rapidly outwards to decimate our shield arrays. For many minutes we flew to meet their wall of heavy ordnance rather than avoiding them. Closing and closer they throttled. And then the Cairn class began to crack reality around it. Already we could see the Eldari spooling up a number of cannons in response to the start of our translation. Greedily several frigates broke free of the spearhead to meet the great tomb ship. The tomb ship fizzled and vanished in a hail of reality rendering cracks. With the cover of the tomb ship removed the fleet of cruisers and escorts vectored at sharp splitting angels. When the tomb ripped back into reality it was significantly closer to the line of Eldery frigates. In a devastating act of first blood the tomb ship unleashed its lightning arc batteries. Instantly the hail of volatile electrical plasma popped a trio of frigates that had been in the way of the rest of the fleet. In that first engagement with the Eldery we very well bloodied them. With Phileas and Agakad having spent a number of centuries in observation and constant simulations of the Eldery method of naval engagements, they were assured to command the fleet in the most efficient and effective way. Having learned every single mechanic capable of the Eldery they were counting the salvos, anticipating their maelstrom abilities and prematurely detonating their disruption bomb before they had the chance to come into proper range. With such tactics and stratagems we would have made Lord Admiral Spire blush. We of course could not avoid all incoming attacks, but we did minimize the amount of heavy ordnance meeting against our shields. Though something unexpected came to my attention. Against all odds Agakut was ordering a massive dirge class raider directly into a line of frigates. It only occurred to me as the massive escorts rammed into the line of Helibor frigate. And carried them crashing into their comrades. That their true power lies in how small of target they proved to be. They were able to repeat this stratagem with minimal losses another 5 times. 
when they disengaged from the wreckage a crack shot from one of the Aurora light cruisers skewed a score of five radar with a single shot did I began focusing in on the rest of the conflict. The Eildere were breaking into three different formations. The first to meet head on against the tomb ship. The second trying to pincer our cruisers. The third. Well it seems like a contingent of four cruisers were headed for one of the fortresses. The one controlled by Agakat. I continued to observe the combat as I worked feverishly to bring about the fortress online but easier said than done. The battle raged on for hours as to be expected for two highly disciplined factions. We were indeed facing the Eildari at their height. For every ship we murdered and crippled they landed a lethal blow. More and more they would use their super psychics to disrupt the flow of combat or to insanely enough. Boarding our fleet ships. Phileas were preparing their own warp cannons to deal with the cruisers. A gak that zone was cycling up as well. Two of the great vol class cruisers banked downwards, while the pair of shadow class cruisers continued their charge regardless. They believed they could weather a blast from the fortress. Pinprick pulsar blasts of lavender white flickered off the surface of the blue energy field shrouding a gak at Starfort. They were definitely trying to break through our defenses. Little by little they did indeed start to wear away at the great shield but it would require several minutes of hammering away from just these two shadow class cruisers. It was true enough by the rules of Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2 that these bigger ships might not go down in one hit. But they were dealing with two fortresses. Finally the pair had charged up. With the combined salvo from two intersecting cannons the cruisers were reduced to broken wraithbone. And surprisingly a world killing beam was more than enough to end the lives of the pair of Eldery cruisers. The other two were feebly trying to enter the fortress. Let them. The vermin will do nothing but provide me with more wraithbone to experiment on. The battle would rage on with constant counterboarding actions and the Eldery hemorrhaging losses. After nearly 8 hours of combat we had successfully erased the Eldery fleet. The only threat we had was the interlopers wagging futile war within the lower decks of Agaklet's fortress. I had confidence in him. 27 years have passed thus far. 43 separate combat encounters. One third of the Necron fleet had been destroyed, what remained of them was secured for reassembly. Another third was critically damaged and was being feverishly fixed up within the confines of the Blackstone fortress. Multiple sabotages had been made by the Eildery but most were rebuffed. Orican had steered us from utter annihilation on more than several occasions but there was only so much he could prevent, even when boosted by my own abilities. We had learned parts of the plans thanks to the usage of mind shackle scarabs. They had as of 4 years ago found Trazin and the other fortress. And had been consistently attacking it. Just to highlight the nature of the conflict thus far. While we are operating at one stroke 3 RD strength after years of ceaseless conflict. We have still managed to annihilate well over 100 Eldery escorts and nearly 50 light cruisers and cruisers. Much of their tactics resemble that of same Han, a craft world noted for their hit and run way of warfare. Though it seems capturing the Eldery for interrogation has been far more challenging to say the least. Ships reclaimed are often rigged to blow. Or perhaps filled to the brim with all manner of organic life forms to aid them. Frustratingly enough they have let loose many capable creatures into our fortress as a means to weaken our defenses. We had multiple proterambal insectoids milling about the lower decks causing unspeakable trouble. Some survivors of the invasion force that managed to enter into the primary fortress under a gaklet's control. Had been captured and implanted with mind shackle scarabs. Many Yildari died in the process as their minds were far more resistant to the commands of the scarab. Those that we managed to investigate we managed to pin down a location, a heading for the craft world, along with some details of the belligerent forces of the Yildari. Approximately 700 ships were dedicated to the effort. A full craft world's arsenal would be used against us. While this was initially a fight we could not hope to win under normal engagement. We would shortly have the upper hand. In those 27 years we had been moving at half speed to the galactic north crushing isolated forces that seemed to be doing their own fair bit of scouting. I had managed to get us up and moving after quite some time after being stationary with our latest fortress but now I had minor navigational power over this new fortress. 
We could fire the warp cannons on 78% power roughly once every two weeks and move at half speed so far. But the ship refused to activate its safety precautions. No shields, no defensive measures, no drones, and one stroke 3 RD of the ship did not have active maglev operations. But against all those odds we now had acquired a weapon that could hold us off against the Eeldery at its sides. Fairly soon we would be taking the fight to the Eeldery. And so we did. When reached the subsector that Trazin occupied. We found a system on fire. And in a little sense their void of space between the great celestial bodies were burning with warp fire. The planets were scored with massive continent size burn marks. In tar moons and other celestial debris floated absent of planetoids. Dozens of cruisers and battlecruisers lay in ruin. Somehow the inklings of a warp storm was burning in the system. And to our horror, two fortresses flew at the heart of the storm. Trazin's fortress fighting off the other. The Eeldery had managed to reclaim one of the fortresses for themselves. And by the looks of things they would have to be stopped soon, lest we have issues. Both fortresses seem to have weathered through some significant damage these last few years. Significant hull damage was peppered across both fortresses, cracks and even occasionally pieces were missing across the pair. The two had all manner of ships boarding, counterboarding actions, and bombing runs, minor scuffles between escorts and attack craft. Coming in hot, we opened communications with Trazin. Getting a rundown it seems the Eeldery had come into possession of one artifact that allowed them access into the fortress. They've managed to take control of the weapons system but not the innermost command chamber. But already they were just outside that chamber fighting off a number of constructs, one of which being one of our Seraptic constructs. That was at least one benefit to us so far. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. No time was wasted deploying our raiders and attack craft to aid against the constant barrage of invading Eeldery ships. Oddly enough we noted several orcoid vessels aiding us. Coming to the stark realizations Trazin had something else up his sleeve. In under an hour we were able to sweep up the attack craft with the utmost prejudice. We promptly destroyed the remaining remnants of Eeldery vessels to ensure no survivors could be saved. With the Eeldery boarding parties reduced to atoms we made for rapid deployment into one of the openings. Going so far as to deploy a fourth of the Guardians and Spindel drones alongside our own troops and constructs. We would ensure a victory for our people. The effect of troops was felt immediately. The influx of guardian drones came to crash against the unwanted Eeldery. Four battalion formations of Eeldery were massacred in the first conflict against the swarm of constructs and drones. Even with prodigious usage of bombs and scatter shots their numbers were quickly overwhelmed. While this was a minor victory something rather unsettling came to our attention. They were spooling up their warp cannon at Agakut's fortresses. What's more, the Empyrean energies seemed sickly here. Like a miniature warp storm being gathered up into the large muzzle of the titanic sized gun. Direct hit in 10 seconds. I informed the other leaders. That sickly warp flame burned with an intense flame. Agakut was unable to react in time. A torrent of frayed MPN energies met against the glowing dull blue of his shields. The flames momentarily washed over the hexagonal grids of the shield array. Before boring through it at the point of impact. The rainbow flame spread out across the fortress surface like liquid tar set ablaze. What uncontained sorcery and unfocused beam, forcing the Empyrean to spill out into real space. This explains so much of why this system was tatted. The realm of souls was being bled into real space. And with so much Eeldery death in the sector it was no wonder the warp was in a state of violent flux. A shelf of the black stone cracked and burned. It was a solid hit, one that actually wounded the upper half of the fortress. 
a Gakud and Phileas wordlessly agreed on something. They focused several raiders to charge and disable the Great Warp Cannon. The Eldery could not be allowed to continue this assault. In seemingly zigzagging fashion the raiders threaded around the Great Cannon. Several peppering beams ran across the length of the weapon. Good, it seems as though the shield array was down. Ramming the cannon was ill-advised. One jackal tried so only to be caught in the horrid flame born of warp storms. From unbodvid captures we could see the necrons melting their very atoms disturbed by the horrid maladies of warp born energies. Soon enough the jackal popped in a flitchet hail of destruction. No other attempts were made to ram the cannon. We resumed our assault but already we could see the malign warp energies gathering into the cannon. Another shot was coming. The cannon began to rotate, its sudden movement shattered several other escorts. It was now aiming for Phileas' own fortress. Phileas acted hastily. Her own cannon spooling up in rapid response. In rapid succession two great gouts of warp energies from each fortress. One contained and focused. The other mass a torrent of hostile malign energies. The two slammed against one another, the beams meshing into one another in volatile whirlwind of reality bending power. Finally setting the two contrasting beams focused to a single point. Together the pair fired off in a planet killing beam off from the main force. Instead of harming us it killed a singular world in a firework show of tectonic destruction. Once more the assault resumed, the jackals began bombing runs. We battered down the cannon non-stop, twice more the fortress fired. And each time the beam was met by our own to divert its course from our conflict. One great horrid gas giant perished, dispersing gas began blanketing the region. We managed to rend the great cannon, cracks formed and warp fire gushed free. Burning the gases of the dying giant. We won but the subsector was burning in the wake of our victory. The cannon was rendered inoperable. The assault took us a week to root them out. Dozens of Bonasinas were captured, and hundreds of Guardian Defenders and Proto-Aspect Warriors were vanquished. Their tactics were unusual, anathema to what I had previously known. I understood their naval patterns, yes, and with Phileas and Agaclet we went so far as to counter them against insurmountable odds. But these deployments of excessive Bonasinas, Corsair jetpacks, Warp spitters, and the unusual hordes of beast was far too divergent from expected troop cohesion. In fact the repeated attempts to deploy inside our fortresses was off-putting. No there was another scheme at play. The Eldry were up to something, and the threads were all there. Something bristled against my consciousness, the fortress was trying to speak to me. A webway jump had been detected. The Eldry had somehow repaired the webway gate on the damaged fortress. Not only that but they had managed to use it as well. It was slow but I had received transmissions of Eldery elements overwhelming his fortress. They were leaving the fortress in droves, some even committing mass suicide. This wasn't within expected parameters. Phileas abdicated her power to another and took to jumping to Agaclet's gate to try and aid him. So that's where they were headed. Agaclet hailed me not long afterwards. He had something to report. The movements of all Eldery elements were scattered, each moving towards different areas of the fortress. They were making rapid grounds with their jump generators, making rapid movements and patterns that defied all logic. In Agaclet's fortress there were several key points of interest. Several chambers that were marked as armories I had neglected to mention to Phileas. My lab where most of my work from once I was previously in the seat and state. And the webway gate. Those were three major points of interest. I informed Phileas of these three locations without tipping her off about the hidden chamber. Over the next two weeks we whittled down their numbers of several thousands. Still we faced many unexpected issues. Our few numbers were being permanently destroyed by unknown means. Those that did survive were found rusted and unable to translate into the resurrection forges. New paths had been dug into walls. Warp fire occasionally blocked off entire chambers, I noted with some horror that there were inklings of brimstone demons occasionally being born and dying within the flames. These warp blights were not strong enough to form as of yet but this was more than enough of a concern for me. Returning to the R, after action report, I noted something. I was receiving quite a few image captures from some of those that had survived and were manually brought back to the forges. 
blurry and sometimes corrupted video captures. The Eldery were in possession of some artifact one I was only just barely able to discover. Several hover drones present in the fortress had captured image captures of a familiar farseer I believed had perished. She was cutting down hundreds of constructs and dozens of immortals with ease. To my horror her hand seemed to be blasting a noxious wretched mess of decaying energy. Russ took over every unit that dared to come near her own rotting hand. To my horror I recognized the item. The hand of darkness. I opened all channels with the command fleet. I informed the top brass of the seriousness of this issue. Our enemies had obtained a weapon capable of nullifying our resurrection protocols. Running through the details of what I knew of the hand of darkness, the heads of Phileas and Oricon dropped. They had the tools to infiltrate our fortresses in ways we could hardly defend against. How the Eldery discovered it or obtained it was a mystery onto its soul. Hold, all those ships throwing themselves at us over the years. Those Eldery craft making impromptu boarding actions with the ships intact. We've been outplayed. I restructured our combat elements, constructs and Shari's troops would be used as cannon fodder to slow them down. That and to ensure we did not suffer losses that would cost us too much. The Eldery battered our units with devastating force. Slowly their force of over 500 warriors was thinned down to nearly 100. Not without extensive cost of drones and around 4700 constructs. All the same the Eldery managed to claim my lab. Which unfortunately they sealed behind themselves. I couldn't quite reach any logic why they would want to take my lab. I was frustrated by this development. For over 3 hours our efforts were rebuffed. They had funneled us into a single corridor and provided unceasing gouts of B-cannon fire. I still had much in the way or a might within that chamber. Seeing as their ranks were devoid of any troop carriers, wraith constructs, and to my knowledge entirely lacking in any methods of item transport I was sure they couldn't take much if that had been their aim. But that had not been their true aim. When the doors of my lab opened I witnessed with horror their true intentions. And let out an anguished cry. A blur across the battlefield whipped through our forces. Our own units could hardly capture a clear image of the thing. I watched a canoptic doomstalker's leg buckle and its weapons misfire into a mass of spitters. The sight of a tomb sentinels overwhelmed by D cannon and prism cannons beams. There was a singular eldery somehow managing to take down our units faster than they could deal with. The farseer, damned her, began her assault with the noxious decay of the hand. So carefully had we laid out our strategy and still we were being rebuffed. They were able to push us further back before they began to make their way upwards. To that direction laid a tunnel which should take them quickly to the command spy chamber if reason could still be claimed. I left the orders up to Phileas to command. I was of no tactical soundness any longer to deal with this catastrophe. Now I need to focus my mind on other matters. Or I try to. But I couldn't. I had finally recognized the Eldery for what it was. A fucking solitaire. My rage was burning over too much. The laughing god interferes with my plans. My grip cracked my command seat. The birth of the Harlequins was utterly inconceivable. More so, it was an unacceptable reality. Phileas and her group of royal wardens and praetorians were closing in and would be engaging soon enough. Her engagement would only serve to diminish my empire of its power. I wouldn't let her do so. I tried to communicate with her, finding that interstitial messaging was strained and was beyond substandard conditions. Frustrated I streamed a subroutine of my being into the fortress's manifold intelligence trying to find a solution. To great surprise it would see the fortress had a solution. The fortress was communicating with its sister fortress. A strange connection that they shared together. I could theoretically impose my own words and will throw it from this distance. Had this been how Abaddon was able to coordinate such a massive fleet? I pulsed my mnemonic recollection of the terrors I had just witnessed through the fortress. I could only hope Phileas would receive the transmission. In the meantime I began the calculations to see the margin of error of our transmission arrays. There was likely nothing I or our force could do to dissuade the Eldery to their heading. In a short hour they would be upon the command spire. The Eldery fortunately didn't have the power or numbers to hold the command center for very long. No reinforcements on their way, no way to hold off indefinitely. 
the realization struck. They had already won, logistically they didn't need to even claim a single fortress. They had attained a means by which to destroy us. Claiming the fortress would be folly instead they would likely alter the course of the webway gates to escape. They had just established the first solitaire and by extension the Harlequin faction millions of years ahead of schedule. Chia Gratch was on their side. If they escape they could rally once more with this hand and use it to make surgical strikes against us. The Eldery and the Harlequins working against us. They had us in a checkmate state. When I tried to connect to Agathlet's command I was instead met with the melancholic voice of Voidmancer for Nornit. Where has Agathlet gone? I have an order for him. The Voidmancer made a noise, she had bad news. She spoke in the same manner of fact tone she always had. Lord Agathlet has gone down to face the foe head on. For Nornit you are to order all constructs to divert their efforts to destroying the webway gate and the command spire. Do this now. I ordered. I could feel my own words crackling over the communications line, overwhelming the short range transmission. She nodded hastily and began her work. Be first Sai the Gaklet of the Votek dynasty. For more than a millennium I have served my lord Ishka high transmogrifier. I would believe I have been dutiful in the responsibility entrusted to me by none other than her grand eminence Ferak Savarek. I have been given command of the first fortress under his orders, an honor of which I shall not soon forget. His high transmogrify has ensured over the millennia that my tutelage in the ways of war should continue. Through ceaseless simulations of both planetary engagements and even naval warfare has been an enlightening experience. During our time before his reawakening he had hid whatever insights of this he had held. To think he had discovered a means to dismantle and counter such a wide variety of stratagems our enemies utilized. It is for this reason I find myself exiting the command chamber to face the enemy head on. To allow the Eldery to even claim a single fortress would be the greatest dishonor I could allow to befall my lord in the dynasty as whole. Reaching the bottom of the command spire I move out into the gargantuan antechamber. Held tightly within my main hand was a hyperface thresher. An armament made by my lord some centuries ago, a hefty weapon to replace my warsick though it held greater weight and shorter range. I have found it to be a fine middle ground between the standard hyperface sword's power and the warside's armor rending ability. And lastly held bare in my offhand was the towering dispersion shield, a bulwark that would need to stand up to the enemy's assault. My host of warriors were waiting for me. At the back of the fortress was the Seraptic heavy construct placed there by our lord at the beginning of the campaign. A myriad of the small spindle drones floated innocuously about the grand antechamber. Their hovering displaced air. Occasionally I could feel streams of infinitesimally alien language data stream on the very edges of their cortical aura. So these little constructs would aid us. I find some level of comedy in that. Enemies that wholesale butchered our warriors were now serving alongside us. The Eldery marched into the antechamber. Just over 100 of their loathsome rank came striding in weapons held aloft. The two prime targets were hidden behind great constructs of the Wraithbone materials. Wraith goods, Wraith blades and Wraith lords, undead warriors not too dissimilar to our own kind. Units my lord classified as elites and heavy support. He told me much of their ways, though never directly. For my lord was a silent instructor. Through millions of combat simulations I have run through I learned more of that hidden esoterica. Imparted in their simulations I learned from the armaments of the troops, the so called flavor texts from each unit, and even the vocalization of named units. Both sides marched in silence towards one another, weapons held aloft yet neither within optimum firing range. Their warp spiders tore forward, as if falling through the air. Shrieking fissures of reality closing behind them as they made rapid way to us. In their backline we noted bestial insectoids burrowing into the very floor of the fortress. I wordlessly ordered my subordinate warriors and immortals to advance. And from a side chamber within the command spire I called upon the advancing rank upon rank of several of these various constructs made by my lord's lab assistant. Eagerly one of these constructs to one of the nearest warp spiders. But its shot merely grazes the ground at its feet. I'm reminded of a phrase my lord once uttered that I believe I now understand. Cannon fodder. The enemy was the first to bear their weapons upon us, 
seeing the first targets with inadequate firing range. The battle could not withstand the constant barrage from that of the enemy's death spinners and shard cabines. Great weapon platforms launched beams of pure sunlight into the spindle drones, only minimal numbers were destroyed. I nearly gave the order to open fire on the innocent enemy, when a disturbance came to my attention. Tearing their way into the front line the horrid insectoids have risen up to the ground above. They tore through the drones with devastating fury, limbs torn and far flung across the floor of the antechamber. Hastily half a dozen scrambled to breach the thick hide of the insect thing, stabbing their thin limbs into the hard shit and exoskeleton. But it is for naught, they are unable to cause so much as cosmetic damage against the hard surface of the beast. This sufferance will not be tolerated. Scores of immortals and even a canoptic reanimator fired upon the beast. It leaked out a noxious itch from the electrically singed wounds but it still remained. It let forth a horrid guttural screech and quickly turned itself away from the rapidly approaching line of warriors. Streams of superheated electricity surges to lash out at its hard shell back. But it was to no avail, its backplate proved too durable for even the best of Tesla weapons. And so I looked to our Seraptic. And gave the order for it to open fire upon the enemy. I stream a sliver of my consciousness into the Seraptex ocular lenses. Witnessing the slight weapons adjustment, the spooling of the singularity generators. A black pulse spring from the weapons, reality rippling like water around the beam. Space and time became unstable around the singularity event. The insectoid raised a fist to try and bat away the beam, as if capable of combating the very physics of reality. Its molecules stretched towards the projectiles, if every atom pulled toward the beam and condensed upon its end. Bones didn't break but simply warp around the final point of the singularity. The beast was no longer there, but in its places was a singular all-consuming wealth of gravity and chronomantic potential. For the flicker of a moment the very light of the room was sucked within an infinitesimally compacted space of the singularity. Gravity seemed to fail for the slightest of moments. Before the condensed point imploded upon itself. It takes a fraction of a second before the Seraptic fires once more devastating another one of the insects. Its implosion of atoms are scattered across the battlefield, and once more darkness shrouds the chamber. In cover of darkness we both made our way into combat. Hails of the missiles and sun cannon lances pop and rend at the spindle drones in darkness. Their lumiant oculars make for perfect targets in the cover of darkness. The fodder of droids are destroyed in great crescendos of metallic explosions. Flying bodies and reality jumping yieldery are sent tumbling to the ground. My immortals sending volley after volley of electricity from Tesla carbines. As the light returned to life. I caught a momentary artifact of a memory brush across a secondary subroutine. I remembered a time during the flesh, my father. He was graying, skin covered in lesions and blisters of our sun curse. Still I could remember every detail of his ornamental garb. Broad halcyon pauldrons, the thin silken fabric adorned with the heraldry of the royal guard. During those times we still held shields of hardened metal made by the skilled artisanal touch of long dead cryptex. He handed me the great coffin shaped shield, my young hands barely able to keep the towering shield propped up. He sniggered watching me struggle for a moment, before his face grew dim. I recall his words to me as when he first said them. When the sun has set upon me my son, it will fall to you to take up the blade and protect your home, country and dynasty. I mouthed quietly to myself as my focus shifted to the scene of war before me. Protect home, country, and dynasty. I march onwards alongside a group of spindle drones. Onwards into the scene of war. More immortal take up gun lines to lance down the enemy. Foolishly enough they press onwards, uselessly firing upon the unceasing ranks of fodder droids. I grin internally and enjoy the murder make. Though it is cut short as quickly my own spindle drone guards are fired upon, shuriken projectiles and monofilament weaponry cut through the drones to ribbons. These shadow weaver support weapons seem quite cumbersome. Fairly soon the fast attacking warp spiders and flying corsairs suffer greater casualties. Batteries from drone and gorse cannons see to their painful ends. To my amusement the Seraptic fires upon a sole surviving warp spider. Already I can trace their guns line breaking. 
Every step the Yildiri takes is one towards their doom. They fire more frantically now. A Vibro cannon fires 4 cubits off the mark of a line of immortals. Their last vestiges of the warp spiders charge into a line of warriors but in time they are torn to shreds by the uncaring warriors. I spot the dying Yildiri as a warrior rends their skull with the blade haft of their gorse weapon. I spot the arrival of more forces entering the chamber along the next wave of droids. Tomb blades, immortals, and even a royal warden. I pulse an order for them to take to the farseer the coward still hidden amongst the wall of wraith constructs. He occupies himself with their back forces as I direct the flow of combat. I come to notice the arrival of swarms of constructs flooding the room, each heading for a side passage. They seek to head to the webway gate. It is of no concern to me. For I will not allow the yieldery the satisfaction of reaching beyond myself. I located one of the threats amongst the crowds. A nimble blow move behind the cover of the guardians. Their intent was the webway gate. Had they fallen back they would have surely perished, every exit cut off to them. This was a means for the Yildiri to escape. Calling to order the nearest score of warriors take aim and begin sending a hail of gorse beams through the guardian defenders. Several of them fell before we struck, scoring the masked jester with a grievous injury. How they were not immolated was a mystery that would have to wait. The flighty jester surged from the broken line of his comrades to meet me. Only a puppet borne upon one wrist, and talon nails in his free hand. I raise my shield to brace against his first attack. I am struck by something. Psychic sorcery works against my back as unusual surges and multiple failures of my power cords come to my attention. Their sorcerers work to embolden the jester's attacks, whilst hindering my own combat prowess. Your ilk won't be able to save you. Thrusting forward, I try to gouge the sapphire-hued thresher into its chest. No good. With a contortionist's grace, the spindly organic twists its body to the back. Dialing my chronosense back, I rotate the hefty blade within my grasp making an outward sweep. The jester lashes its minuscule pipet against the massive blade. Its piercing metallic tube glides along the edge of my weapon's power field. Stealing the energy of my mighty strike. No, not stealing. Transferring the momentum entirely. The jester allows itself to be pushed away as a means to create space between us. Its soft boots skid back several cubits. I howl and raise my thresher back to continue my assault. But in the span of a fraction of a second the jester closes the distance. Crackling blue and volatile sparks emanate from the tips of its talon digits. A speed not native to the Yildiri flowed through the Jester. Its movements were able to match my already heightened chronosense. Like some craven beast it slashes skywards against my dispersion shield, its energy field snapping like plucked strings. Its pipet weapon is thrust towards my torso but I parry the blow against the thresher. This hardly serves as a deterrent, instead it emboldens the Jester to continue the assault. Pivoting on its heel it presses forward. Lashing its talon digits across my chest, rib casing rending as its talon nails sailed through my necrodermis with no resistance. And once more against my death mask, then lashing again, it tears its way across my pauldron and arm. In just the course of a second the jester has managed to sunder if not seriously wound several key components of my being. I answer by flicking the blunt of my weapon against his frame, battering the jester away for a moment. Wounded as the jester was, it was still a cause for alarm. Exhaling unnecessarily I take a step back, quickly my necrodermis mends my death mask and limp arm. I've yet to land a blow on this eeldery and yet it has nearly brought me to the brink of death in just a moment. Kicking forward I lunge my thresher towards its center mass. Pushed back the blow it rebuffed. Swiftly it reposts, trying to find purchase with its pipet once again. The pipet rings out loudly as it meets the hard surface of the defensive shield. A screech rang out against my shield, bucking and pushing me back half a pace. I could hear the power field pop once again against such stress. I let the heavy shield weigh me down no longer. Casting it down it crashed down with a weight thud. Raising my blade the pair of us danced the duelists dance. We were a spectacle amongst the scene of slaughter of our people. The Yildiri against the Necron. The living against the dead. Warm flesh against cold metal. Dozens of attacks lunged for me, 
Each parried, dodged or redirected elsewhere. In between those moments I returned my own precision strikes. Some met with cutting fabrics, others simply kissed the jester's flesh. Nothing I did seemed to land with any killing power. Every blow dodged, every cut non-lethal, every second he didn't die I grew stronger. My living metal repairing itself to near completion. My chrono sneeze had long since diminished as I fought each second in the very moment. A vitality I had not felt since ages gone came to me. Fire burned within my chest roaring and growing hotter with every passing second. Seeing my chance I plunged a sweeping strike to its head. Before my blade found purchase. Something tore up from underneath my chin. Servos plucked. Circuits broken. Coolant leaking. It had plunged its hand through my chin driving the meaty digits into the depths of my cerebral matrix. Static overcame my eye, body spasming as my mind began breaking. I had taken critical damage, I was no longer fit for combat. I felt the pipette lodge itself in the gap of my chest cavity. Uncounted threads tore through the complex mechanical structure of my torso. My reactor flensed, my spine column shredded beyond any repair, networks of coolant transit ducts sliced. That fire in my chest started to recede. I was going to be transported back to the forges to be remade. I failed. I failed to protect my home, my country, my dynasty. It was a failure that my master would not allow. My once raging fire, now cool and dimmed, flickered in my chest. No. I raged against my death. That flame overtook me before my atoms could be translated to the forges. I tore forward with my barely functioning hand and gripped the Eildari's throat. He tried to cut my arm with some level of success. Still I felt my thresher bite into flesh. A spray of sanguine liquid spray my oculars, I had cleaved into the warrior's shoulder. Unable to complete the cut the blade back I rock the blade back and forth to free it from its shoulder. I felt the weapon fall back, free of its body, my legs were fading away as I was being translated. A killing strike, I needed to cut aside the jester, it needed to perish by my blade. The weapon was far too heavy, I could hardly lift it. I threw myself at the jester torso as they stumbled back. My blade braced against my chest. They were too overtaken in mortal pain to have avoided my sluggish body. One small blade found flesh, its leg. Muffled howls escaped the silent jester. I was content at last, having mortally wounded the jester twice. My troops would terminate that which I could not. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.